I knew I didn't want to rap like everybody else. You know what I mean? I knew I wanted to still embody the Texas culture within my music, but still, you know, show that we got people that are lyrical. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because, like, where I'm from in down south, you know, they the quote and the stigma is that, you know, down south artists aren't lyricists and we can't spit. So I make sure every time I drop a project, I balance, you know, with my culture, the screw heads, uh, the people that want to hear bars, and mm-hmm. then the ladies, and then whatever the hell I want to make. My creative EDM, you know, DJ Marshmallow, DJ Snake. That's where DJ your mind Seth. is at? Yeah, I, I do EDM. Right. Yeah, I was touring with uh, Marshmallow and uh, I fuck with, you know, Clint Sparks. And, but know. that's interesting to hear you say that, like, that is like the main thing that your creativity tends to go towards. Mine? Yeah, the EDM type stuff. Is that like really like that's sort oh, yeah. of your passion at this moment or where you think that like, progression has taken place? It, it's, it's a, I do them all. Like I've been doing EDM. Like I got an artist that I partnered up with. His name's Critchy Critch. He's out here now okay. in LA. Uh, and he like, I knew about like house music, techno and, you know, EDM, but like he, he made me look at music a different way. Like everybody I meet, like let's, let, let's say for instance, me doing music with David Banner, like, we from Texas, we laid back, you know. Me doing business and music and tours with David Banner and his energy, it showed me a different angle for me to be a performer, right? Mm. So, you know, I, I, I've witnessed but Buster Rhymes and uh, DMXs, these great performers, you know, performing. So it just put me in a different mind frame, man. And um, In terms of, like, what a live performance could be? Because sometimes, I mean, let's just be real. Sometimes rap just doesn't really translate as well to the live experience. Like, we've all seen great rappers who realistically weren't really putting on that great a show. And maybe the show is still dope because the audience is so into it. Right. But without the audience, they're barely moving and they're not really getting into it. And there's not really a whole lot going on. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that happens all the time. Were you sort of out to... Do you feel like you you were kind of trying to disprove that assumption about the South, that y'all weren't, like, serious rappers? Correct. That, if, that's, how, that's, that's been my motivation for most of my career. Well, like, mm-hmm. when I do an album, in my mind, I'm like, I, I got to make something for, you know, because I got family and people that's in New York, right? So I know what they like and what they listen to and who they, you know, idolize and who they consider to be the top rappers and blah, blah, blah. So... I pay attention and I'm I go in the lab like, yeah, this for my homie from the Bronx. I'm finna, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I can I already know he go hit his beat, you know what <laughs> I mean? So I go into that zone and then I just I cook up and it comes out naturally. Definitely. And it's weird how that assumption about the South has kind of gone away over the years because like I was just listening to this whole podcast about Megan the Stallion the other day and talking about how her mom was this rapper and how her mom like influenced her so much to to be real serious about her lyricism and stuff and i don't think at any point during that conversation anybody was like oh yeah but the assumption is that people from down south can't rap or whatever like that has kind of washed away to the point that that's not an assumption that anybody's making i don't think it's still around but Mm -hmm. it's not around as much but you know it's still in the comment bars. Oh, you still see it in the comments? Yeah. I guess you're privy to different types of bullshit out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I glance here and there, but I, I try not to. You right. know what I mean? Like, I, at the end of the day, that's, that'll drive you crazy if you keep paying attention there. Oh, like, yeah. You got you to gotta have a ton of vision, man. Do what you do. Create your art. Mm. If you proud of that shit, put it out. You just don't want to be the kind of, like, I, I know certain old heads that I'm not going to mention, but they just don't seem to understand how Instagram works. They respond to all the haters and shit. And it's like, bro, you do not need to be doing that because you're just revving them up to talk more shit. Yeah, man, we don't participate in that shit. Yeah. Nigga would block your ass. <laughs> my, my tumbo, not in my house. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> like, 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 I don't tolerate that shit in my shit. Like. Right. Like, on your Instagram, it's kind of like, how are you coming into my area right here? Yeah. It's different on Twitter because it's like on Twitter, anybody can not be following you and post something that is like retweeting you and talking shit about you, but you don't have any actual involvement in it. They're putting it on their Twitter. If they're going to talk shit in your comments on your Instagram, that is really the the feeling is like they just came to your house and are just standing out in the front yard talking shit. Yeah. Yeah, people be bored, man. I, I ain't got time for that shit, man. You you need to be trying to figure out how to get some more money for your family, man. Mm. You know, so I just stay out of people's business. Definitely. 
Um, so what your first record, your first record that you put out, or let's talk about the decision to even sign to a major in the first place. What do you recall that, that time period in your life? And were you just a hundred percent ready to go on that front? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was time like making money in the streets and off of music. Like when you, you know, you in the streets and you making bread like fast, fast and you know, it's way less than what you would get to go do a show. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. kind of, you, you don't be as fast to move for it. But when somebody coming to you talking about like M's, you know what I mean? Twenties and thirties. It shifts your focus into like, okay, all right, let's, let's really do it because I had enough money to shoot videos to every record I had in my life, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I wasn't in that mind frame. I was like, Hey man, we making money. You know what I mean? We still, they still booking us. You know what I mean? So it was, I felt it was time to, you know, see what the fuss is about with being attached to a brand, mm. a label with all these contacts. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and we traveled around the world and we had our own. Mm. So now let's combine their contacts with ours and get paid and still hustle like we don't have them. Who who did you sign to? Out the uh, gig? Columbia. Right. And then um, Steve Rifkin left. Shout out to Steve Rifkin. Uh huh. He the one signed us, man. I they had Akon on my tour, like bro, before he like blew the fuck up, like. Really. Yeah, man. That's crazy. Yeah, I wish I would have did more music. Well, I did music with him. I liked this shit though. That locked up shit was dope. Oh yeah. But I was like doing so much shit, man. But you know, and he ended up fucking with uh, was signing Lady Gaga. Signing Lady Gaga. Gaga. And, He's rich forever off that. Yeah, that's dope though. But I knew he was jamming though. So, you know, shout out to Akon, man. Shout out to Akon. I was supposed to have an Akon interview a while back. Akon, man, come on, Where man. Where you at? Do it, do, it, do it, man. Do it for my guy. <laughs> we need that love. Yeah. Facts. Um, did you feel like Columbia were respectful of what you were bringing to the table? Or did you feel like, to an extent, they were trying to shape you and mold you into something that you weren't necessarily comfortable with? Nah, man. They, like Steve, he knew the culture. Um he appreciated everything and he knew it. You know, he he walked like us, talked like like it was. It didn't feel like I was partnering up with somebody, you know, with a tie who never go to the hood. Mm. You know, who hires people to go. Hey, what? Well, find out what's going on. Like, you know, he he'll go. You know what I mean? Like, and um, that meant a lot to me. So you know, they just let me be me. You know, I had creative control. It was a label deal. Mm. I didn't do an artist deal. So, you know. Creative control, you know. I always think about that when I'm dealing with labels. I always think about that Wu Tang lyric, and he said, uh, "Who's your A and R? A mountain climber who plays an electric guitar." I remember mm. being a little kid hearing that and being like, "Wow! Like, there's really people who like work in the rap industry who don't know anything about rap." And then when you go actually go to labels, you realize like, "Oh, that's actually probably the majority of people that work at labels." Yeah, man. It's but things changing, man. People. You know, the right people are getting in position, mm. and um, the game has did a 180. You feel like that? Yeah. In what sense? With, with the streams. Right. Instead of people buying stuff, and now streams are counting as, like, you know, sales. Yeah. It's more of, like, a connection to what is actually popular. Like, it's harder for the label to shove something down the public's throat now. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the rappers, like, when you look at the Double XL covers, it kind of went from, if you look at the early years, it was kind of like, these are the artists that the labels want to pop off. And then nowadays, it's kind of like, well, these are the artists who were already kind of popping off, and then the labels had to jump on top of them and give them a whole bunch of money to sign them. Yeah. It's like a little bit of a change in how the that shit takes place. I agree. Yeah. Um, so you get on the label and your first project comes out and are you all of a sudden just this like global superstar and your whole profile just explodes and everything is just all of a sudden way different? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was epic, yeah. And so you're just on this roller coaster ride? Are you just all of a sudden on tour just living like a completely different life? How, how'd it I, go? My life didn't change, just how much I was getting paid mm. off of rap. But I still was like, getting street money like I just I'm programmed to hustle right mm -hmm. so it, it just took me to you know get enough rap money and and be like you know what man this now it's now this is look is looking like I'm tripping you know what I mean like mm -hmm. so once I focus and say all right we finna go in and, and 
I just started, you know, doing other business deals and um, linking up with other producers and, you know, rest in peace to Static, you know, he out there, you know what I'm saying? He be born out there in uh, the Kentucky area, man, Louisville. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met him, Young Real, Young Sears, and I started putting together me a team and, you know, getting my, my army. I signed Lil Ron. Um, he was with the uh, Swisher House. He had mm-hmm. a record that had that drink up in my cup, and uh, he on there. And um, when I talked to his mom, like, hey, man, I believe in your son. Uh, I want to take him out of school, get him a tutor. She was like, all right, cool. So I ain't never, I was 18 or well, 19, 20, you know, right up, you know, I ain't never did that, you know, before, but. Uh, 19 making boss moves. Yeah, I did it. And I was getting my team ready. Then I had Young Red and, you know, we did the HSC. So I always, you know, execute my plans with thoughts of the people who looked out for me in the wing figuring out a way to bring them in. Right. When you say street money, you mean that you were really in the streets or were you just selling your albums on the streets? Both. Right. But was it a big deal to decide that you needed to leave that shit behind? Yeah, it was a big deal. Really? Were there people who were disappointed in you? Uh, a few, but I always try to surround myself with people who think like me. Right. And I believe, like, if you have a convo with somebody and tell them, hey, you know, if you like blindside a person, like, hey, man. We've been doing business together, but I'm out. Yeah, today. Yeah. It's like, you know, hey, this is my mind frame. I'm on this. Blah, blah, blah. You know. Definitely. Bonito. Was it a weird transition where all of a sudden, I feel like for somebody like you who's coming from such a real place, that all of a sudden they're taking you and they're putting you in front of all these different uh like, you know, media opportunities. You got all these people who basically just don't understand where you're coming from at all. And you're just being put under this lens where they're sort of analyzing you. And all the things that you think are kind of normal about yourself are all of a sudden this, like, funny little gimmick to them. It didn't happen like that for me because when I got my deal, I, I was already going to all, all, pretty much all the places they had me going to. I, had, I was going to those places and already kind of, like, dealing with a lot of the media. Mm. So it wasn't like a jump. And then you got to remember, my family members do music, right? So mm. I know the games and the things that, the, you know, the way media twist things. And you got to be careful what you say, you feel me? Mm-hmm. And one of the best things I can say about when I did go to Columbia, they had me take a uh, media train. Oh, you did it. How was that? Even though I knew what to do already, but right. me taking it made me. See, that's the thing about when you learn from different teachers, you, you get to – Cause you might have have somebody be like, you know, ah, man, this is the way you're supposed to do it. This is the only way. Mm-hmm. And then somebody else train you, and they're like, this is the only way. This. So then in your mind, you're like, damn, what well, he told me. You know what I mean? So, you know. Damn the media training. That's a fucking wild thing to actually go through. I've like heard about it so much, and I've mm-hmm. always been curious about what they actually tell you in that shit. I epic shit, and and that's the dope part about it. Like. I put a book out called Don't Let the Music Industry Fool You probably eight years ago. Oh, that was eight years now? Yeah. Okay. We about to do like these workshops, like me and Miss Jesse over there, that's my business partner, we do a lot of dope shit. So like, we about to do these workshops where we go around the world and we go have it where they can spend hours with us and we go talk to them, we go offer, you know, media training and you know, I paint too, so I'll be painting with some of the people, but really? we go give them like a real platform so they know what to look for because a lot of artists still to this day is like you know sign me like you can you can sign yourself Mm. it ain't hard do you see that Uh, yeah that's that's a weird thing that has happened where it's like artists don't really need labels now but is a it's still a prevalent mentality that you need to be signed if you really want to do anything man you can spend your own money on yourself run your facebook ads your twitter ads (laughs) and different things and you ain't got to go by the red bottoms. You can, you know, we'll, we'll show you, man. Just holler at us. You know, we will <laughs> consult with you. And, and we ain't on no try to hit you upside the head. Like, mm. our prices go be reasonable, but I connect your up here. So, you know, it got to make sense. But, yeah. Do you ever think about what your career might have been like if you had stayed independent? Nah, because... I knew, like, some of the tricks to the game already by, you know, my other family members being in it. Right. So I was pretty much well prepared by my family for what to look for. So 
I was always taught it's a time to play a wolf and it's a time to be a sheep. Uh -huh. So if any situation a person saw me in <clears throat> and they considered me being a sheep in that moment, it was all calculated. Right. No, that is a weird feeling for a lot of people. I feel like, like even myself, my first time I signed a record, day, a record deal and was really working with a label, it's like, damn, this is the first time in my whole life that I really feel like I had a job. Not my whole life, but since I was a kid. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. really feel like you're actually just going into some office and just having to, like, talk to people and shit. I just had never really had to have that kind of mentality, flip that switch of just feeling like I'm an employee all of a sudden. And I guess for a lot of a lot of rappers, that's really where the, the conflict starts with the labels, that they're just not used to acting like, you know, a, a, a person that has to get along with others, that has to be able to uh, make shit work in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it's, it's big business, man. You just got to watch it, everybody. Micro and macro manage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like as an East Coast kid that you were part of like this huge movement too. Because if you really think about it, and like I think Outkast got booed at the Source Awards in maybe '98 or '99, and then all of a sudden, four or five years later, we had like you know a huge wave of Texas rappers and down south rappers coming out, and all of a sudden, the disrespect that Outkast had been shown in that situation felt like a, a distant memory. Like, that was kind of that last blast of elitism from New York, of feeling like people down south didn't matter. And then all of a sudden, that kind of culminated. Four or five years later, we had people like you and Paul Wall and Slim Thug, everybody just sort of, like, having this mainstream moment that had not really been something that people could have imagined even just a few years prior. Yeah, that was an epic moment. And you were one of the, the faces of that, of really, really changing shit. Yeah. But did it feel like that? It did. It felt like that. Um, but I never, like, took time to, like, bask in it. Like, you know, I did this. Like, in my mind, I'm like, all right, it's time to do another one. Mm. All right, that's one plaque. We need, we need more. In that moment, you never really know exactly how important or yeah. what, how significant what you're doing is. You never know that 20 years later people are still going to be talking about the, the shit that you were doing at that moment. Yeah. And so as you realize what's going on, it, it makes you grow. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And you can tell it even in my music. You know what I mean? Definitely. Um, I feel like also as like an East Coast kid that when you did collabs with Dipset and G-Unit, that, that was like a big moment that not just me, but everybody that I was around, that's yeah. when like you started to get on the radar of like the average person that I was familiar with who realistically, that's what we were listening to. Yeah. You know? I, I was talking about that the other day. Which one? No, just the era of when I was, because you know, like, like I tell you, the stigma of down south artists can't spit. So in my mind, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to New York. I'm finna go rap with the best, I'm the, the Camerons, the, you know, Dipsets, you know, 50, whoever, you know what I mean? And um, DJ Who Kid. Shout out Who Kid. Um, DJ Red Alert. Who else y'all love, like, at the beginning? Clue, Funk Flex, K Slay, can't forget K. Like, all those people, you know what I mean? They they really fucked with me in a genuine way. Mm -hmm. And, um... So, you know, we would do it. We Duke the God, shout out to Duke the God. I'm on a few of his albums. Man, me and Duke the God got so fucking drunk with one time. Like yeah. just we tried to do an interview and we just got fucking Free loaded. Jewels, man. Free Jewels. I fuck with Jewels, man. Jewels hard, man. Like like Jewels got bars. I like I fuck with that monster music. Right. That's my favorite Jewels and record. Jewels like at that time. I feel like he was a person that was sort of observing the more simple style of rapping or the more slow down style of rapping that was largely coming from down south. And then he sort of didn't bite that, but sort of took on some of those characteristics because people forget that Joel's when he came out, he was like the wild ass swaggy little motherfucker that like yeah. he was rapping in such a way that a lot of people really didn't respect it because it was just so new and like different. It was unorthodox. Totally. But I fucked with it, boy. We we like like like, people that are entertainers, like, as a kid, like, you know, young, like, a lot of us, you know what I mean? We we kind of root for the other ones. When you see, it's like when you put a kid in a music video, and it, the record might be not even appropriate for them, mm. but if you put kids in a music video, when the kids see other kids on TV, mm. they're like, man, he can do it. They're going to run to the TV. Like, that's one of us. Like, you know what right. I mean? So, hey, 
you know, when I see artists like that, you know, with that 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 swag, the jewelry, you know what I mean? I, I, hey, that's one of us. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that was like there's been certain times I remember I was interviewing uh, Rico Reckless one time. He's sitting here with his son and his son is watching music videos the whole time we're doing the interview and he's watching Lil Pump, Maddox, Lil Skies, Lil, you know, just all these little rappers. Every rap, take hey, just rappers who to him felt like they had that youthful energy that he could relate to them. Mm-hmm. And it's just a kind of wild thing to realize like how important that is. And when you see a song, when you see songs on YouTube or whatever that do hundreds of millions of views, chances are that they tapped into the young ass audience too. Because those are the ones who just sit there camped out in front of the TV just watching something a hundred times. <laughs> yeah. Facts. Mm. Um, Okay, so yeah, do, do you recall the actually like working with Cameron for the first time, or what that might have been like? Yeah, yeah, Cameron always been one of my favorite rappers. Um, like he, I think he went to college like in Navarro County, uh-huh. of course, in He talked about it on one of his albums. Right, um, I think it's the sports, drugs, and entertainment. Sports, drugs, and entertainment. Yeah, okay, he, he got that record. He talked about it, but um, yeah, let me think. First time we did records, man. We, I think, we, yeah, I was in New York. And then we went to like a show. I think he had a show. And then we left, went to the studio. And, you know, they that's back when everybody was smoking Dutchess. And mm. I'm like, man, where are the swishers, bro? Like, we smoke, <laughs> you know what I mean? They were so strong. I'm like, bro. But I was smoking them like, fuck it, you know? But yeah, it was dope. We, we knocked out, um, I think the first record me and him did was the. Man, wait, what mixtape he put that shit on? That, that uh, push your pistols in the to club with G's and Dipset. We could probably Damn. figure it out. Yeah, I'm trying to think. And I was jamming <laughs> this like two fucking weeks ago. We could probably figure it out with a quick Google. Pistols, uh, we got to do this. If you let you rap in your mind, nigga. I say everybody want to be pop until they really get shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hustle Hard featuring Lil Flip. Cameron. Is that what you're thinking nah, of? That's the, nah, bust your, bust guns. your Guns. Bust, the, bust Your Guns was the first one. Like I say, everybody want to be pop until they really get shot. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, you guys have a couple of classics. It's so weird when you go on YouTube and even see 10 years ago. And it was longer than that. Yeah. 2009. Hustle, Hustle, Hustle Hard was the second record we did. Like, I think we... I'm trying to think if we did these all in one day. I think we had two different sessions or whatever. And then one time we did a show together somewhere in Ohio back when he had that club. And, mm-hmm. and I think we, you know, we we catch each other, on, you know, on the road, you know, Source Awards. I mean, you guys were both like two of the hottest new young dudes coming out. So it must have been like a wild com- combined energy at that time. And the dope part about it is, like, I'm not just a, a new Cameron fan, right? Mm. I'm a Cameron fan from back in the Children of the Corn days when he oh, was wow. rapping with Big L. Right. Like, Big L is one of my favorite rappers. My favorite Big L record is Ebonics. Really? Ah, oh, man. He killed it. That's a classic one. Even though none of that slang must have been anything that you were used to saying at that time, right? Not me, but I heard it. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I have family in New York, so right. they would come to Texas and be like, yo, son. I'd be like, we'd be like, um... I'm not your son. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why you keep calling me that, bro? Like, Growing up, a son then, was what a cop would call you. Man. Come here, son. Man. That wasn't something you <laughs> called your friends. Yeah. <laughs> but then that just became a thing at a certain point. Mm-hmm. 